Somewhere over the Pacific, a tanker crew watches the horizon and wonders if they'll be the first target. On the ground, aging bombers, legends with wrinkled logbooks, wait for another sortie they were never meant to fly in a world like this. And while the buff still thunders, the bone still sprints, and the spirit still slips through the dark, the clock has been ticking since the Cold War. And tonight, that clock is getting louder. So here's the question that actually matters. When the enemy builds a wall of sensors, missiles, and warships, from the first island chain to the second, what gets through? Not a theory, not a PowerPoint, but something that can take off from home soil, thread the needle through the densest air defenses on Earth, and put any target at risk without asking for a refueler to stick its neck out. Enter the B-21 Raider. On paper, it's a stealth bomber. In reality, it's a system shift, a penetrating strike aircraft born digital and designed to be upgraded just like your phone and built in numbers that are big enough to matter. And if you think that's just marketing, wait until you see what the second Raider did on its very first flight. No external test gear, no training wheels. And we're gonna take a deep dive into why that matters and what it says about the Raider's digital twin. I'll show you in a minute. We're also gonna peel back the skin on the parts they tried to hide at rollout, the back end. Because if you wanna understand stealth in 2025, you start with heat, those exhausts, and the art of making a bomber look cold to a sky full of infrared eyes. Old fleets, new threats, and a jet built to flip the script. So stay with me because by the end, you'll know why the Raider isn't just the next bomber, it's the one they built for the fight we actually face. PilotPhotog.com The B-21 Raider is more than just an upgrade from the B-2 Spirit. It's actually a response to the new era of global power dynamics. But to understand this, we need to not look at the how when it comes to the Raider, but rather the why. Today's US Air Force bomber fleet is old with airframe ages measured in decades instead of years. You've got the forever flying B-52 Stratofortress, of which the newest one was built in 1962. That's the newest one. And that's back when Kennedy was still president. What that means is that the newest buff is 63 years old. And while the B-1 and B-2 are of course newer than the buff, they're also still long in the tooth. For example, the newest B-1 Lancer is tail number 86-0140, aka the last Lancer, which was delivered in 1988, making it 37 years old in 2025. And it doesn't get much better for the B-2 Spirit, which had a somewhat complicated delivery situation. You see, the final B-2 Spirit delivered to the US Air Force was the Spirit of America, which was a rebuilt and upgraded test airframe. That converted test airplane to a production example officially joined the operational fleet in 2000, which marked the end of B-2 production. That makes the newest B-2 over 25 years old, which is older than most Air Force Academy grads. Now, before we talk about the Raider, let's take a quick break to talk about something that keeps me mission ready, no matter what I'm working on. This video is sponsored by Raycon. And right now, Raycon is celebrating their anniversary with a deal you'll want to jump on. Their Everyday Earbuds Classic are now 20% off. Reliable, super comfortable, and easy to take anywhere, you'll see why they've been a fan favorite since day one. Now, I use mine when I'm out walking the dogs or editing footage for the channel. What I really like is how they stay put no matter what I'm doing. And that active noise cancellation helps me tune out distractions so I can focus. And if I need to stay aware, I just switch on awareness mode. Perfect for when I'm outside. They've also added multi-point connectivity, so I can pair my laptop and my phone at the same time. And battery life? You get up to 32 hours with the case. Plus quick charge. So just 10 minutes gives you 90 minutes of playtime. That's huge when I forget to top them off before heading out. The new colors are great too. Personally, I'm into electric blue. So they don't just sound good, they feel like an accessory that fits my style. And here's the best part. Raycon delivers the same premium audio quality as the big brands, but at half the price. 
With over 3 million happy customers and a 30-day happiness guarantee, there's no reason to overpay. So if you want to support the channel and get a great deal, click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash pilotphotog to get 20% off the Everyday Earbuds Classic. That's buyraycon.com slash pilotphotog. All right, now that we're all tuned in, let's get back to the skies because it's not just an aging fleet that's driving the need for the B-21 Raider. While today's B-2 Spirit is still considered by many the stealthiest aircraft in the sky, the harsh reality is that there are only 19 of them. This small force can only be used as a silver bullet for very specific situations like what we saw in Operation Midnight Hammer earlier this year. Yet, given today's complex geopolitical situation, where a conflict in the Pacific with a near-peer enemy is becoming more and more likely, 19 airframes just won't cut it. And despite continuous upgrades to both the B-52 and B-1, today, they are mainly seen as platforms to launch standoff weapons outside of heavily defended airspace. Because of this, the Raider is intended to fill the gap and create a large force of advanced bombers that can strike any target anywhere in the world. The Raider has been engineered from the ground up as a dual capable, penetrating strike stealth bomber. With the Air Force intending to order no less than 100 airframes, and maybe even 200 examples by the time production ends. Now, we'll get to the stealth features in a moment, but first, we need to talk about one of the Raiders' more important features, range. In a potential Pacific conflict with China, forward air bases and refueling tankers will be primary targets in China's overall anti-access area denial or A2AD strategy. Because of this, the Raider will need to have intercontinental range while also carrying a large payload. The idea here is to be able to project power from the mainland United States or Australia, which will act as a hedge against allied targets that are within those first and second island chains in the Pacific. You can think of the B-21 Raider as the cornerstone of America's nuclear modernization strategy. It's going to be built to replace legacy Cold War bombers like the B-1 and eventually even the B-52. Also remember that the B-1 no longer carries nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not throwing shade at the B-1 or even the buff. They both earned their legendary status. In fact, I've covered the B-1's incredible story in its own video, which you can check out after this one. Links are in the description below. But getting back to the Raider, it will eventually become the backbone of the air-breathing leg of America's nuclear triad, while also being able to carry conventional bombs. So far, we've only talked about theory and concept when it comes to the Raider. And while that's great for understanding how it should work, nothing compares to seeing the real thing take flight. Well, unless you have two of them flying. On September 11th, 2025, a second Raider took to the skies. The newest Raider took off from Northrop Grumman's Plant 42 in Palmdale, California, and it flew over to Edwards Air Force Base for more testing. Having a second airframe available allows the Air Force to go beyond basic flight tests and move into weapons testing and mission readiness. You can think of it as two parallel efforts. One aircraft could test aerodynamics while the other could test sensors and fly mission profiles. Another interesting thing to note about the second Raider is that it flew in a clean configuration. If you remember, the first Raider, nicknamed Cerberus, had a data probe and a trailing cone deployed as it took off. Now, as of the recording of this video, there is no official nickname for the second Raider. However, some are calling it Spartan, based on the artwork that has been seen on the jet. Now, you almost can't understate this. The fact that the second B-21 flew with no external test gear tells us something huge. What this means is that the data from the first jet matched so perfectly with the aircraft's digital twin that engineers already trusted how it would perform. In other words, they were confident enough with the second jet to skip the training wheels. And that's a massive win for the B-21's digital design philosophy and a big reason why this program has actually stayed on time and on budget. Something that's almost unheard of in modern military aviation. But this isn't just a win for the pilots and designers. Having two flying examples also allows maintainers 
to get hands-on experience turning around two jets for flight ops and developing maintenance schedules for the Raider. Northrop is working hard to make each example of the Raider as production ready as possible, so that when the assembly line does kick into full gear, all of the tooling and maintenance procedures are in place from day one. The second Raider really moves things from testing an airplane to building a combat system. All right, now it's time to talk about the stealth design of the Raider. You see, the B-21 Raider isn't just another stealth bomber. It's what happens when you take the legendary B-2 Spirit and give it 30 years of upgrades and materials, aerodynamics, and manufacturing tech. Thanks to some recent photos, we've finally gotten our best look at the Raider's shape, especially that mysterious aft section. And well, it's nothing short of a stealth masterclass in both art and engineering. To take a deeper dive with these stealth features, we'll start with the rear of the jet. For years, the rear aspect of the B-21 was a closely guarded secret. If you remember, during the bomber's reveal, they only showed the front of the jet and partially pulled it out of the hangar. Now, this wasn't a coincidence. It was a lesson learned from the 1988 reveal of the B-2, incidentally at the same facility. Back then, a crafty journalist rented a Cessna to fly over the ceremony and get photos of the spirit on the ground. This showed the world the exhaust design of the B-2. But why is exhaust design such a big deal? Well, it turns out that hot engine exhaust is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, source of IR or infrared emissions. Now, when most people think about stealth today, they think about radar evasion and preventing radar detection. But one of the more recent ways to detect a stealth aircraft is by using infrared search and track or IRST sensors. These sensors are passive, meaning that they don't give off any emissions and can be used to literally see an aircraft without radar emissions. They're also small enough that they can be mounted on fighters and are relatively cheap compared to air defense radar systems. To counter this, the Raider takes a similar but improved approach from the B-2 Spirit. Just like the B-2, the B-21 has its engines buried deep within the airframe, and the engine's exhaust is ducted through channels before being expelled through flat, slot-like objects. Doing this does several key things. Number one, it completely shields the hottest parts of the engine, which are the turbine and the combustor, from view, especially from ground-based threats that are looking up. The second thing it does is spread the exhaust over a wide, flat area, allowing it to mix with cooler air, thereby lowering its temperature. In the B2, we can also see special materials in the channels that are used to cool the gases even further. But what makes the B-21 Raider different in this case is, rather than using a sawtooth trailing edge that the B-2 uses at the exhaust channel, the Raider makes use of an advanced design with advanced materials. By using an updated geometry and likely some airflow mixing even before the exhaust exit, the Raider manages heat far more efficiently. Imagine the advancements in material science as well as computing power since the 1980s and you'll start to understand how far the Raider has come. But the Raider is more than just a flying heatsink. It's been designed for all spectrum low observability. What that means is that the Raider is meant to minimize its signature across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And that includes radar, coarse infrared, acoustic, and even visual detection. That's another huge leap from the B-2, which was mainly designed to defeat Cold War era Soviet radar systems. Now, one of the biggest strengths and weaknesses of any stealth aircraft is the application of radar absorbent materials or RAM coatings. These coatings basically absorb radar signals and that helps keep the aircraft invisible or low observable. However, these coatings are expensive, they wear out from the elements and flight operations, and they need to be reapplied, usually by hand. Now fortunately, the B-21's RAM coatings use next-gen materials and are designed to be effective against a much wider range of frequencies. And from what we've seen, they're also much more durable than the notorious delicate coatings used by the B-2. Now when it comes to the actual geometry of the B-21's airframe, it's basically a study in stealth optimization. The engine intakes, which are usually a major source of radar reflection, are more flush with a fuselage than the B-2s. The cockpit windows are also redesigned, which eliminates seams that could create radar hotspots. This new window design helps keep
keep that ever critical frontal radar cross section as low as possible. Now, many have also noticed that the B21 is smaller than the B2 and will likely carry a lesser payload. But this is intentional. Where the B2 was designed for a Cold War mission of carrying large nuclear gravity bombs, the B-21 is made for a modern era of more precise, networked warfare. You see, today the Air Force is looking for a larger, more survivable fleet over the sheer payload of a single airframe. A smaller aircraft is stealthier, more affordable to build and operate, and with a planned 100 airframes, it'll be five times larger than the current B-2 fleet. You can think of it like this. The B-2 was built in the analog, handcrafted age and the B-21 is being built in the digital age with models-based systems engineering. Now that brings us to what's under the hood. If the F-35 is a flying supercomputer, then the B-21 is a flying data center. Introduced as the world's first sixth generation aircraft, one of the core concepts of the Raider is its Open System Architecture or OSA. Older systems like the B-2 are built on closed hardware and software from the 1980s which makes upgrading slow, expensive, and invasive. Because of this, B-2 Spirit upgrades usually require depot level modifications. However, with the B-21's OSA, it works more like your modern smartphone's operating system. This is because the hardware is decoupled from the software, which allows for rapid, seamless upgrades through software updates on the software side and by using modular hardware components on the hardware side. What you get is a near future proof jet with new applications, sensors, or weapon systems that can be added with minimal downtime. Quick side note, this is one of the reasons that upgrading the F-14 Tomcat was such a huge undertaking. The entire jet was analog and basically hardwired to work with the AWG-9 radar system and the AIM-54 Phoenix missile. But in the Raiders case, because of the ease of upgrades and flexibility, the B-21 could flip the script on the bomber's actual role. Traditionally, bombers have been used as finishers in the kill chain, showing up after intel has been gathered and targets identified. With the Raider's extreme stealth, long range, and massive sensor suite, it can fly recon, conduct battle management, serve as a comms node behind enemy lines, and strike targets, all in the same mission. Also remember that while the initial B-21s will have a crew of two pilots, the Raider was designed from the ground up to be optionally manned, meaning that a Raider could fly as a very high-powered and capable drone, staying airborne for days without having to worry about crew rest. With pilots on board, the Raider could also work as a forward drone controller, coordinating large flights of collaborative combat aircraft or CCAs in fighter-sized drone swarms that could neutralize enemy air defenses or high value targets while keeping the pilots out of the danger zone. So what does this all add up to? Essentially, the Raider isn't just another shiny jet. It's the Air Force's answer to decades of aging bombers, shrinking force size, and a far more dangerous, sensor-rich battlefield. We went from B-52s built in the Kennedy era to B-2s and B-1s that are middle-aged or older. And that reality shaped everything about how the B-21 was built. Long range, true low observability, digital engineering, open system upgrades, and the option to fly with or without pilots on board. Put simply, the B-21 is meant to be the bomber fleet that the Air Force actually needs for the 21st century. Big enough in numbers to matter, stealthy enough to survive, and flexible enough to keep getting better after it leaves the factory. It's not a replacement for nostalgia, it's a practical tool for deterrence and warfighting in a world that's changed dramatically since the last bomber line shut down. And here's the question you're probably asking yourself. When the B-21 finally retires, how many B-52s will still be flying? Comment below, thanks for watching, and if you like this video, be sure to subscribe for more. This is Tog, and now you know. pilotphotog.com